The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Episode 615 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for spending your time with me because, as I always say, you've always got time for Short Time. I'm Jason Bryant. Brady Buck is our guest today. He recently finished his story called Unmatched, which is a nonfiction story chronicling a vision quest of sorts by a guy named Brett Roller and his quest to unseat undefeated three-time state champion Tom Klum. Yes, that Tom Klum, who was an eventual All-American at Wisconsin. Well, Klum was an undefeated three-timer going into his final match of his senior year. And this guy from Wasson High School in Colorado Springs upended Tom Klum. That's the story. Yes, the the, the story about him winning is or losing is, is part of the story, but it's everything leading up to it. So it's like, you know the ending. Now, here's how we got there. So... Before we get to the interview, I do want to remind you, go to madtalkonline.com slash news. Sign up for free for your daily wrestling email newsletter. This comes to your inbox pretty much six days a week. I do take one of the two weekend days off. Sometimes I'll take Friday off, and you won't get it Saturday morning or Sunday morning, but you'll get something Monday, depending on the news flow. Well, that is free, delivered to your email each and every day. Every show here on the network is free. However... If you are interested in contributing to this network and supporting the efforts that go on with my historical research, the litany of shows here on the Mad Talk Podcast Network, and some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, whether it be equipment upkeep, things of that nature. Well, you know, I had to buy a new microphone this week because I'm announcing a wrestling event this week. Yes, Minnesota number one out in Minnetonka this week. And I'm actually socially distancing, announcing a high school wrestling all-star dual meet here in the great state of Minnesota. That'll be streamed live on Track Wrestling. Check that out, Minnesota number one. I'm looking forward to it, so thanks to Al Venz and Josh Raymond of the Al and Josh Show. That's a podcast pretty much about Minnesota high school, mostly high school wrestling, but you know, Al's son uh, Taylor wrestles at Nebraska. Josh's kids are coming up through the high school ranks, so real good show there if you're interested in the Minnesota type of wrestling thing. So thanks to them for reaching out, getting me involved. I am excited, but I'm also excited for you to support the network. You can do so at matttalkonline.com slash join the team, or simply going to the Patreon page, patreon.com slash matttalkonline. Want to also make a note that if you are unsure about the the monthly thing, well, now Patreon has opened the door to a one-time annual donation. So if you just want to do it once and be done with it, that is available to you now. But before we get to the interview with Brady Buck, I do want to close out the intro here uh, on a sad note. Is is got a couple things that came up. Uh, we lost a couple wrestlers this week. First, Cleveland State lost Caleb Stockmaster after a two year battle with cancer, and uh, that, I know that's gone through the the Cleveland State community. I saw Coach Josh Moore post something about that on Facebook. I didn't know Caleb. I didn't know much about the story other than you know it's something that he'd been fighting, and and people had rallied around him. The more abrupt story is something that hits a little close to home, while not directly. Dustin Baxter was a multiple-time state champion, a Division three football player, and a three-time Division three All-American at St. John's University here in Minnesota. That's uh, just kind of outside of St. Cloud. You might have heard of St. John's for the legendary runs that they had in Division three football. I mean, they're the winningest coach. Uh, Gagliardi is the winningest coach in Division three football. But So Dustin Baxter, how do I know Dustin Baxter? His brother, Kalen Baxter, they're from Fairbanks up in Alaska, Kalen Baxter was one of the early recruiting classes that came to Old Dominion with Coach Steve Martin. I met Kalen Baxter on his recruiting trip. That summer, Kalen went and wrestled in Fargo, placed, and he's not one, there's one of a, a handful of Alaska wrestlers on the freestyle side to place. Actually threw Kyler Sanderson on his head during that tournament. And that week, I got to meet Ron Baxter, Kalen's dad. And then through that, I meet Dustin. And then I'm so I'm following Dustin's career as he goes to St. John's to play football and wrestle, dealing with some injuries. He was ultimately a runner up at the Division Three Championships in 2012 and, you know, got to, got to call that match. And the last time I saw Ron was actually 
2012 after Dustin's finals match in lacrosse, Wisconsin. So um, I didn't really, you know, I, I got, I, I love the family. Ron and Tammy are great people. Kalen, just one of the, one of the, the best kids I ever met. Now, of course, he's, he's in his mid thirties now and, you know, he's back coaching. I saw him in Fargo the last time we went to Fargo, bad mustache and all. I mean, we got some funny Fargo stories that really are just probably a little TMI, but you know, I got to know this wrestling family from Alaska. And then when I first saw the tweet from another St. John, former St. John's wrestler, Minga Batsuk, a uh, Mongolian native who was a three-time national champion for Coach uh, Brandon Novak's team, is that Dustin had drowned. And I'm like, what? And I, I went and searched it, and sure enough, there was the story. And, you know, this one hits... When I say it hits close, it's not just like, well, my friend's brother. Well, one of my friends from my hometown was also the manager at Old Dominion and is very, very good friends with, with Kalen. So I've got my hometown involved. I've got my alma mater that no longer has wrestling involved. I've got my friend's family. And uh, 2020 sucks, doesn't it? It just it just sucks. And life is fragile. And it, it it's just the details around what happened to Dustin are are. I mean, they're relevant, but I don't want to really get into them because I don't know a whole lot. But I know our friends in the wrestling community are standing by the Baxters. They're standing by Kale, and They're standing by Ron and Tammy. You know, I'm, I look forward to seeing Kalen every year now that I know he's coaching Fargo. I mean, I, I look forward to just telling those jokes and then talking about Dustin. You know, it was one of those things that even though Dustin and I did not have a relationship, but being able to share in the success of your friends and watching them from afar. So being able to sit there in lacrosse and be like, Hey, Ron, what's up? You know, Dustin's in the finals kind of stuff. And, you know, hoping he, you know, I think he lost a year uh, to knee injury, I believe when he was, was playing because he, he placed three times for St. John. So uh, this one was, this was a, you know, it just, it's one of those things that just sucks. There's no other real way to put it. So I just want our thoughts in the wrestling community to be with the Cleveland State community, to be with the St. John's community, to be with the Old Dominion community, to be with the West Valley High School in Fairbanks, Alaska community, the entire Alaska wrestling community, because it's their family up there in Alaska. It's 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 a you know everybody is it's it's familial. It's something that you've got that bond, and you know I I can try to understand it, but I don't know it. So I just want to give my thanks to the Baxter family to what they've they've done for me and been to me over the years even though we don't see each other as much as we should thoughts prayers condolences and best wishes to the baxters up in alaska and with that we'll get to our interview with brady buck talking about unmatched here on the short time wrestling podcast Another episode of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, and it's one of those things where when you find a book, you read a book, you enjoy a book, you want to talk about the book, and today I'm going to talk with Brady Buck. He finished his book, Unmatched Prep Wrestling's Epic Chronicle, recently, a story about a young man named Tom Klum, who you might know is a multiple-time All-American at the University of Wisconsin who hailed from Colorado, and Brady, this project, years in in, in the works, you finally got it done, it's, it's out there, it's a solid story, and now, first off, Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Happy to be on. Before we even get into the story of Tom Clum, which I remember is, is Tom's a couple years young, or younger than I am, and I remember hearing about it uh, as I was breaking into the national wrestling scene going, what? What? And we'll get to that story for those of you who don't know it, but what was your wrestling background and, and what made you want to write a book about wrestling? Jason, so my background in the sport of wrestling is very uninteresting. Uh, I did a lot of youth wrestling as a kid. And didn't have much success at all. I think I was third or fourth place at every local Pee Wee tournament I ever went to for about five or six years. So I started getting more into basketball as I got into junior high, and that became my focus. Uh, looking back, I, I kind of regret it. I wish I would have stuck it out in the sport a little bit. But just the inability to have any success at a young age kind of took away from my confidence in the sport. And consequently, I ended up going the direction of basketball. Which, which is kind of funny. I catch a lot of crap about it, having wrote this wrestling book. Well, I mean, I was a basketball, or I, I fancied myself as a basketball and baseball player, and then I moved to a wrestling crazed town and realized that uh didn't have much height, and um, the opportunity for me to stand unguarded at the top of the key really kind of limited my effectiveness as far as the jump shot goes. I mean, uh, <laughs> getting over to your story, you know, you uh, you know, growing up Colorado, Tom Clum is a thing, so what, what made the story about Tom Clum intriguing to you to want to write a book on this? 
Yeah, so I remember, I think I was 10 or 11 years old at the time. I remember reading the front page of the Denver Post back in February of 2001. This was in the days where print journalism was the gospel. And we got the Denver Post delivered all the way out in Ray, Colorado, about three hours east of Denver uh, through my childhood. And I vividly remember reading the, the story about Tom Plum. Uh, my brothers and I and my dad followed his story his journey through his remarkable wrestling career at Pomona High School in Arvada, Colorado. And the shock factor of the story, Jason, just, just kind of stuck with me all through my life. And, and everyone that we knew that had a connection to Tom Clum just spoke very highly of him. And it was, it was unbelievable. And 20 years later, it still is unbelievable. But as I got older, I did some sports journalism in college, just kind of as a fun extracurricular hobby and really enjoyed it and always kind of thought maybe someday if the right opportunity presented itself I, i'd try to write a book or some sort of journalistic project that really piqued my interest and man the older i got i'd go back to the colorado state wrestling tournament every year and i'd watch it and it, I, the story of tom Plum and brett roller just kept creeping back in my mind and i i just decided that i was going to dive in i call it my one third life crisis. Uh, I, I went all in, uh, and thankfully I was able to get to the finish line. I almost got derailed a few different times, but the story is just so unique. I don't think we'll see anything like it uh, the rest of my life. I'd be surprised if we did. And and nowadays those types of upsets, you they just don't happen anymore. Those elite wrestlers are just so much better than your just good to very good high school wrestlers it seems like nowadays we, we don't see that level of upset occur hardly ever anymore so i to me i took it upon myself i wanted to document this story so future generations could consume it i felt it was worthy it, it's truly in this day and age hard to find a story that is unique i felt it was worthy it, it was it was kind of a hollywood type script story to me so uh it was a passion project of mine, and uh, I, I enjoyed every second of the journey. Now, one thing we've done, we've kind of purposely buried the lead here. You're like, okay, if you're unfamiliar with what we're talking about, Tom Clum, you're like, okay, yeah, get to the story, get to the story. So Tom Clum, there had been four-time state champions in Colorado, but there had never been an undefeated four-time high school state champion in Colorado history. Tom Clum was undefeated, three-time champion going into his senior year, and standing in his way, well, whether he knew it or not, was a guy named Brett Roller from Wasson High School down in Colorado Springs. The eventual nugget to this story is that Roller beats Clum in the final match of the state. I mean, this, again, there's your Hollywood script. So that is the story you're writing. That's the story you're following. Colorado people know the outcome of the match. What I didn't know was the buildup, what led to it. I didn't know Brett Roller's story. I, you know, I didn't actually, it, it took me until reading your book. I didn't realize Wasson High School had closed. I lived in Colorado Springs for three years. So I, I knew the area you were talking. I knew about Doherty. I knew about, you know, I had friends that went to Doherty High School in Colorado Springs. So for me as a reader, knowing a little bit about the story and then going through and be like, oh, I know that. I know that. I know that. I had to drive through Arvada all the time to pick up my wife from the airport, which in case if you know where the Denver airport, it's basically in Kansas. And it is just, I mean, just so many things that hit me and not growing up in Colorado just filled in so many of the gaps and the question marks. And and when you write this, who would you really write this for? Was this for the Colorado public or was this for the greater wrestling public? I would say both, but I think it is relatable to any person. Uh, you know, I had a lot of people compliment me on the book that didn't know a darn thing about the sport of wrestling, but really enjoyed the story. And it's not an overly technical wrestling story. It's more of a story about human spirit and competition and, and the journey more so than the actual technicalities of wrestling uh, strategy, if you will. So, uh, I mean, it, it appeals to a broad brush of people. Yeah, and what's interesting, you talked about your backstory. You talked about Ray, Colorado. And I hear Ray, I think that's out near Otis, right? Because my buddy's from Otis. And, yep. you know, Cody Bickley, who is uh, who works at USA Wrestling, and his coach, Bob Smith. And then you've got the Fixes, who are originally yep. from Ray. So, you know, if wrestling fans out there hear the name Dayton Fix, well, dad was from Ray, Colorado. So, and, and, and granddad was a national champion, I believe, back in the day. I, I want to say for Colorado School of Mines, if I'm not mistaken. But again, Ray, a, a, a blue collar wrestling town, which even though you, you said you grew up wrestling, it's, 
it it, it was still part of the culture out there. And how much did that really shape the, the mindset you had coming in to tell the story? Yeah, it, it helped a lot. Jason Ray is a historical wrestling powerhouse town, and Bob Smith is kind of a Colorado icon and a family friend of ours. And Bob Smith actually helped get me in touch with Tom Beeson and a lot of these guys at Pomona High School to help get me started in this process of writing because it was a challenge for me as a stranger to try to go back and reach out to all these people who don't know who I am to write this project of mine. And Bob Smith was instrumental in that. And being from Ray really helped my cause in that because when people hear Ray, they do think of wrestling. Yeah, I, th I think Bob, I mean, Cody Bickley told me a little bit about growing up in that area. And, and you know, Bob was his coach at Fort Hayes State. So it, it's one of those things that, you know, even the connections. And then one thing I, I'm curious about is is the different directions, you know, you know, in your movie, you have all these various subplots that all funnel into one greater story. There were a couple different subplots. I mean, you got the story of Clum and then you got the story of Roller and we'll get into the, the nuances of both of those stories. But one of the cool things I thought that you merged into this story was a guy named Jacob Palomino from California. And those who remember Jacob Palomino, he was on a quest to become the first four-time state champion in California. And then he got knocked off his senior year by a guy who would eventually become a four-time champion in Daryl Vasquez. So when you're putting these two, the, the stories together, how much did the, the Palomino journey, did you really feel was relevant to this story and, and come to find out when they actually met, it just branched off from there. I mean, how, how did you meld them together? Yeah. So I did not know the Jacob Palomino story at all in its affiliation with Tom Plum until I really got into the process. But when I think it was Tom that mentioned it to me, I did some more research on it and it was like jackpot. Wow. That is, that like, is dude, no way this is happening. This yeah. is happening to two people in the same story, same timeline. Yes. And it just added another motor to the story because there was this high point in Tom's career of beating Jacob Palomino and Jason back then these national high school wrestling tournaments weren't nearly as popular as they are today. And for a Colorado team, Colorado's not as thought of as highly in the wrestling world as states like California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Iowa, states like that. So for Tom to go to Reno, meet the mere image of himself, a better version of himself perhaps from the state of California and to beat him in the finals was pretty remarkable, and it, it just added a lot of substance and intrigue to Tom's journey because they Pomona made a conscious effort to go to Reno to try to get Tom beat because they thought it would just make him a better wrestler, and it just so happens that he beat uh, Palomino 3-1, to one, I think was the final score. I can't remember off the top of my head if it went into overtime, but just the epicness of that collision course between two kids trying to do something really historic in their respective states made Tom's story that much better. And Palomino probably deserves a, a story written on him and himself because he was fascinating to talk to. I had a chance to visit with him on the phone for a while. And uh, his, his memory of Tom was very fond. And it, it's just funny looking back on it 20 years later <laughs> in, in the past and uh, the interconnectedness of the sport of wrestling. It's just such a beautiful thing. Looking at, you say, 20 years, what would that type of matchup mean today? I mean, how it, it would be all over flow. It'd be all over the message boards and Twitter. I mean, that type of matchup. I mean, it, I remember the result, somebody saying something about it on the message board. And again, but but just the coverage of wrestling then still in its infancy, so to speak. And, you know, as the story will grow greater as 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 it, we get further and further away. But, you know, when you had a chance to talk to both Tom and, and Jacob Palomino about that match, I mean, how how much do they remember the, the vivid details of each of that bout? Yeah, you, you could feel some exhilaration in their voice when I brought up that match because I think Tom was quoted as saying, I mean, that was his biggest win of his wrestling life up until that point. And I think for him, it was a big springboard in recruiting, right? He what maybe wasn't thought of as a super highly touted uh, national recruit, if you will, but after he beat Jacob Palomino, the floodgates kind of opened for Tom and he was more, a, more of a national name at that point. It, it's just a, it was a defining win for him. I mean, the cool thing about wrestling, Ben Shannington said it, every, every wrestler and their journey, they're kind of defined by three or four epic matches. And, and that was one for Tom and uh, you know, Jacob Palomino, obviously too. 
Yeah, and, and it's funny how those names come in because, you know, Ben Charrington wins a national title for Boise State, actually beats a kid from my wrestling club named Brian Stith who ended up wrestling at Arizona State. And then what's, what's interesting, again, I've got some, I feel like there's certain ties that I remember and, you know, names, you, you know, names like Clint Wolfley, I remember him. And then, you know, you got, you got Charrington in there and then you've you just got these, you know, names and high schools from Colorado. But what's, what's funny about this is I read it. And, you know, I have never written a book and there's there's a great legacy at my at my wrestling high school. But in my high school in the, in the 80s, there was a guy named Casey Graham, who was a three time state champ, going to be the school's second four timer, wasn't undefeated, but was going to be a four timer and got pinned with what one or two seconds to go in the match while winning the match. So in, in my hometown's wrestling history, there's this disappointment of a three timer losing his fourth in such dramatic like oh my goodness, Hollywood type of fashion. I believe the story was is the, the crowd got ahead of the count and he thought it was over and then he got pinned. And, you know, it's like they thought it was the curse of the four-timer or something. So as, I, as I'm as i sitting there going, how is this going to unravel for Tom Clum? When we get to Brett Roller's story, who um, kind of, I don't want to say anti-hero in this regard because didn't have much of a college career to speak of, did some did some fighting, but uh, basically just kind of fell off the map wrestling-wise after he wins and completes his vision quest. So uh, Brett Roller, you know, this was this was the highest thing he had on his on his ledger, so to speak. And how hard was it to bring these things up with him when you're writing the book? You know, it was fascinating talking to Brett. His perspective on his journey was so interesting to me. And he I appreciate his candor. He told me that quote, if I had put the same effort into trying to beat Clum that year into other areas of life, I could have been a multimillionaire. So he, he recognizes that, that maybe that, that was a, one of the highest points in his life. And yeah, he didn't live up to the, that billing of beating Tom in college and he kind of had a, a falling out in college. He got, he had bad luck. Uh, he got hurt right away. And his career just kind of unraveled, which is which is kind of the case for a lot of these guys once they get to the college level. But the contrast between Brett and Tom was one of the more fascinating things in the story. You know, Brett's identity was really rooted in wrestling and, and that win he had over Tom. And Tom, I mean, he wouldn't even describe himself as a wrestler unless you pressed him on it. I mean, he thought of himself more as a hunter. And the wins, the losses never really got to him. And that that juxtaposition of perspectives on the sport and their wrestling careers was, was really fascinating and and Brett really opened up and, and he really his candor allowed me to really explore his mindset and what he was thinking and chasing Tom and kudos to him for doing something that maybe no other kid in the history of the country has been able to do for a kid to never even wrestle an official college match to be a division one big 10 all american i mean you just you don't see that in today's day and age uh so i, I mean i really enjoyed talking to brett uh fascinating guy and, and kind of had some bad luck in college and unfortunately did, didn't live up to his potential uh in his college career one thing i i found fascinating about the story and, and then having that looking at it from a journalistic perspective and any and writing perspective is you go in sometimes with a story a narrative in mind on how you're going to connect these two and how to show the the similarities and the differences but when you when you peel back the layers and and you learn more about Brett Roller and you learn more about Tom Clum vastly different and it's not just because you're you're telling the story that way you've got the uh you know the the very church going family and the rough around the edges type of guy i mean you, you've got i don't want to say polar opposites but they're different enough to make this a very compelling individual story as well no doubt about it yeah you hit the nail on the head there uh and and to me that that was a big motor for the story um <laughs> really everything about them was almost opposite in a way but they're they're going to be linked forever in history going forward. You can't, it, it's the defining story of Colorado high school wrestling. I mean, there will be never anything that surpasses it. And the two contrasts between them, uh, just, just so unique. Uh, we won't see anything again like it. What's also interesting, you you brought this up in in earlier in the interview about how you don't see that anymore. Well, one thing you don't see is one, like in my home state of Virginia, we've got six public school classes and a seventh private school. So uh, even when we had three classes, we didn't have the three and four time champions that were running parallel to one another crisscross at the state tournament. You see the elite kids 
uh, from the power programs that are maybe in the same class, they don't go the same weight classes. So they all can win multiple titles at a time. Whereas you've got a guy like, you know, that opens the door for guys like roller who nobody's, you know, for lack of a better term, had heard of at the time to come through and say, okay, I'm on the big stage with this stud. And, uh, you know, it's like, he's not, he wasn't just happy to be here. This was part of it, but you don't see it anymore. You don't see elite kids going certain weight classes. You don't see loud and swain anymore. You don't see Brett roller anymore. So, uh, what was the one thing that, in, in this process that kind of said, yeah, this, that part of the story is also worth telling. You mentioned the movie vision quest. I mean, th- this is the real, even better Hollywood version of vision quest. The, the moment where Brett tells his high school coaches at Wasson early in the fall that he's going to go after Tom Plum in his senior year. And his coaches just look at each other like Brett's crazy. I mean, he could win a state title at any other weight class in his senior year and go out with a bang, why would he want to go chase down the best wrestler the state of Colorado had ever seen? And and that's not hyperbole. At the time, the best the state had ever seen. Nobody had ever done it. And B- Brett's mom said, I'm worried about Brett's safety. Uh, he's going to get embarrassed. What's he doing? His friends made fun of him. So it, it really was a real-life vision quest. And Brett put in a world of work to get to that point. And kudos to him. Uh, you know, his side of the story is equally as fascinating as Tom, which makes the collective story so much better. You know, I can also make another comparison because uh, the uh, the Netflix series Cobra Kai, which most people know is a is a a sequel series to the karate kid movies and you know where where ralph macchio's character daniel larusso is and where johnny lawrence is are are two diametrically opposed positions in the world they're still and it's like it all goes back to the 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 fight at the all valley karate championships and that's still like it's that's like in the back of my mind a little bit as i read this and it's like man this it's like again hollywood you know truth is stranger than fiction in so many ways now when we get to the actual book process, the writing process, the editing process, the the trimming process, this being the first enterprise that you've gone in this and, and being in a sport that's, you know, has so many of these Hollywood-esque storylines, but you, you've got so much to condense. I mean, what was the some of the hurdles you had in trying to say, okay, the story needs to be this long? Uh, what type of help did you have in kind of fine-tuning the length of the story, so to speak? Yeah, it, it was a daunting task at first. Uh, so to kind of go through the process, I, when I decided I wanted to do it, first I had to talk to Tom and Brett and get access from them, permission from them to write about their lives, their high school careers. And they were willing to. I had a little pushback from Tom at first, uh, which was difficult. And I'm very thankful that he gave me the access that he did, because without that, I couldn't have written the story, obviously. And then from there, I started doing interviews with about 30 different people associated with the story because I had to go back and like, I really had to learn the personalities of these people, the details of the events. I mean, we all, everybody knew the outcome of the story, but what were all the events that led up to that? What were these two individuals starting the sport? What were the defining moments leading up into that 2001 state championship, which was the obvious climax of the story? Uh, so once I had all the interviews done and transcribed, I was able to kind of structure an outline for the story to organize all my thoughts and different plot lines and subplots. And it's funny, actually, one of the first interviews I did was with Brett Roller. And the first thing he said was actually ended up being the ending of the book. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks and spoiler alert, it, it's when Tom and Brett see each other with their kids in their adult lives at a youth tournament, which was just gold to me as a writer. So once I had that, I had a direction. I knew I was going to try to get to that point, and I knew I was covering a broad uh, couple decades in time. So I needed to have good pace, but I knew what the key points were. I knew how I wanted to start. I knew I had to start with a bang. I couldn't start in perfectly chronological order because quite frankly, the beginning of the two's start in the sport just isn't one of the more interesting points of the story. So I, I opted to start at the end of Tom's uh, junior year. And I, I really tried to hammer home the historic component of Tom's quest, 
introduce some characters and from there get into more of the chrono chronological order of the story after introducing Brett. So once I had all the information, I just started writing my first few dozen drafts. They weren't very good, but the way I thought of it is I just had to get everything to paper, just puke it all to paper. And so I finally got everything I wanted to on paper, and it's about 120,000 words. And that was too long. Uh, There's too much fat in a lot of places, so I had to trim it down. And I eventually, over time, about six months of editing it, I got it down to about 80,000, which I felt was about right. I wanted to keep the pace healthy. I wanted to keep the story moving. I didn't want to lose anyone. So I, I settled on 80,000. Uh, I hired an editor online to kind of help me polish the product. But once I got everything on paper, it, it was a lot easier to polish it uh, than it was to just get everything on there. I knew it wasn't good, but from there, you can at least work with it. You can polish it up and you can fix what you need to, trim it and make it better from there. Uh, so once I got to that point, it, it was sort of all downhill from there. And the, the writing part really wasn't work to me. I, I enjoyed it. The words kind of just flowed naturally to me. I, I subscribed to. Uh, old news databases as well to access all the old Denver Post, Rocky Mountain News, Colorado Springs Gazette articles to get all those little facts right, the dates right, uh, the match scores right, because all, all that information doesn't exist uh, on the common internet. You, you have to subscribe to a database to access it. So that really helped me out. Uh, and then, you know, after about two years, uh, finally got to the finish line on it the way you're starting the story, you know how it ends. I'm starting reading the story. I know how it ends. You know, it's just like one of those yeah. things. It's like, and then trying to, I mean, is it, was it a work backwards thing? I mean, I know the chronology, as you said, you know, you know, straight to forward eight years old, they're both wrestling. Okay. Now they're, you know, almost 40 with kids. That's, you know, that, that, that's not, you know, that's not how the story should be read and that's not how you set it up. So that 80,000 words, you, you get it down to, I mean, how hard was it though? That stuff that you real, the juicy stuff you, you had to let go. How hard is that for some for something? He's like, oh, this this meant so much. You might you might have just had to say, all right, you're you're out of here. I have to, I have to leave. I have to leave you out of the book. Yeah, it was hard, but you, you kind of you have to keep your scope narrowed to some degree. I contemplated a lot diving in a little bit more into Tom's college career, which he's on record as saying meant a heck of a lot more to him than his actual high school career. But the emotional motor of the story was the high school part of the story. And I didn't want to devalue the high school story with too much about his college career, which is extremely notable in its own right. Uh, don't get me wrong. So I, I had a lot of words written on his college career, but ultimately uh, condensed it quite a bit and made it part of the epilogue so people could see how he ended up doing in his uh, time at Madison, Wisconsin, wrestling for the Badgers. Uh, but, but it was difficult to, to leave that out because it was important to Tom, and he, he thinks more about those college losses than he does his mm -hmm. one loss in his uh, Colorado high school career. But uh, in terms of the messaging and the themes and, and the power, I mean, it, it was really his Pomona career that, that hit the hardest. So... I opted to concentrate on that and keep everything geared towards that, if you will. A couple topics I want to touch on before we get back to some of the the, the reviews and such. And uh, I talked with Troy Nickerson, uh, the head coach at Northern Colorado, for another show here uh, recently. And we talked about the Colorado High School State Tournament. First time I attended. Oh, my goodness. Are you the hype is real. This is a, a an event. You know, last one out of town and Ray shuts off the lights. I mean, it's, uh, you know, same with Meeker and places like that and, and Rifle. Just these little towns, uh, you know, up in the mountains that are they're bringing their whole town to the state tournament. So. Uh, explain what that's like, I guess, as an outsider experiencing the Colorado, the, the Chasta State Tournament for the first time at the Pepsi Center. It's a remarkable event. The state of Colorado does such a good job putting it on. For those that don't know, it's the third week of every February at the Pepsi Center, which is the home to the Colorado Avalanche and Denver Nuggets. So it is a world-class professional arena, and it, it's about brim full every Saturday night for the championship bouts about 18, 19, 20,000 people on hand from all corners, all counties of the state, all types of demographics. For a lot of people, it's their only opportunity to see an actual event in a professional sports arena 
So you can imagine the enthusiasm that the sport of wrestling brings and you throw all classifications in one venue for one energy packed weekend. It's quite a spectacle. I try to go every year just as a sports fan. Uh, the, the talent in the state of Colorado continues to be on the rise. I think, you know, it, it's climbing in the national regard of uh, quality high school wrestling states. Uh, it, it is just such a fun event to watch. Uh, I always circle it on my calendar every year. There's always a lot of college recruiters there evaluating the Colorado talent. Um, so it, it's something you hate to miss every February. How's the response been after the release from the Colorado community? It, it's been overwhelmingly positive, Jason. Uh, it, it's funny. I'll, I've gotten calls from people I don't even know, and they applaud the book. They love the book. They want to learn more about the process. Uh, I've gotten compliments from people that I don't think have opened a book since high school, and they probably have never read for fun in their entire life. People with not much education in their background cowboys if you will uh, and they read it in one sitting and, and they're just in love with it so that's been the humbling aspect you know is, is hearing these compliments from people and really everyone in the state knew about the story uh even if they had no connection at all to the sport of wrestling they remember this story which you can't really say that about any other story in the history of colorado high school athletics by any stretch uh, so, so it's, it's been fun, uh, to hear people's reaction to it. I've gotten text messages from people that I hardly know, or I haven't spoken to in a long, long time. And I was just shocked they read it, let alone took the time to reach out to me and compliment me about the work. So, uh, it, it's been neat to see the reaction and, uh, hopefully I continues to, to gain some traction out there across the country as more people find the book. Yeah, and, and the reason I asked Colorado, and then I, I'm curious about maybe some national reaction that you've gotten from people that didn't know about the story or maybe who came across the book and said, oh, this is a wrestling story, let me read it. I mean, what type of feedback have you gotten from people who may not have known Tom Clum got beat his last match uh, trying to become an undefeated four-time state champion? Yeah, uh, it, it really is uh, a one-of-a-kind story, and you know, a, a kid like Spencer Lee had a similar story, but he lost to an opponent that was a pretty nationally elite uh, recruit in his own right. So the factor of Brett Roller, Roller is just an X factor in separating this story from some of the other upsets that we've seen in the past. But, uh, you know, it, it hasn't, the book hasn't reached the national level as much. You know, I had planned to do some marketing uh, in the spring, but thanks to COVID-19, a lot of the wrestling events shut down in the spring, so I lost a little bit of momentum uh, on the marketing front, and I haven't been able to expand its reach as much as I like, but hopefully over time, I mean, the, the book, the great thing about the book is it's going to exist forever, so over time, hopefully more eyeballs will find it. Yeah, and before we even uh, go any further on that, it's you can find it at unmatchedthebook.com. You can, you know, there, there's links to buy it and such. You're, you're at Brady Buck on Twitter. But uh, again, you go to the website and go to where to buy. There's links right there via Amazon. You've also got some, looks like you've got some uh, audio components coming to it soon. Yeah, I hope to get an audio book version of this book done at some point in the next year or so. I think that might be the preferred form for a lot of people nowadays in consuming uh, these type of stories. I, I don't know how how popular sitting down and reading a print book is anymore. I have a Kindle version available of the book now, but uh, hopefully we get an audio book finished not in the not so distant future. I don't read as much as I probably should. For somebody that asks me, is like, what do you got to do to be a better writer? I, I, my response is usually read more. You read the people you like. You read the styles of of things that you want to write about. For example, I've got like the best in American sports writing, several volumes of that. And uh, yeah, I haven't even taken my own advice in, in reading some of those. But, you know, you sit down, you read a, a page turner like, you know, I'll say the, the Hunger Games prequel, for example, is something I really dove into and finished in in a really short time, considering it's a 500 book, a 500 page book and no pun intended about the show. And your book, I don't I think I was done in a day. I mean, it was maybe maybe two days. I mean, it was it was one of those things where I was just so, uh, you know, being being a real story, being a nonfiction story. I'm just like, yep. 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 And at some point I'm like, okay, um, you did a great job in terms of getting me to turn off my, my inner editor and just 
enjoy the story the way you told it for what it is because again it was this was real life yeah i I really tried hard to drive the narrative and keep the pace healthy and try to get the reader to turn the page when i read material i mean i I don't like lengthy chapters i don't like fluff i like a pace (laughs) we all have short attention spans in today's society i understand that so i didn't want a 500 page book on this story i felt the 70 80 thousand uh, yard marker was about right for this. That's that was the perfect length for this story. And and so I every time I tried to end chapters on a strong note. I really put a lot of emphasis on that to get people incentivized to start reading the next chapter. And I tried to keep that consistent the whole way through and just continually build towards that 2001 state finals match that pretty much everyone already knew the outcome too. Now, when it comes to putting something like this together, there are a lot of wrestling writers out there that have that have done uh, a prolific number of books, self-published and such. What are the struggles that uh, you had to go through in, in putting this thing together and actually, you know, having it bound and sitting there going, okay, here's an actual book you can actually order and actually read. I mean, there's there, there's there's some things that you got to go through that you probably weren't expecting. Yeah, and being a good writer isn't enough. You have to be obsessed with the subject matter in order it for it to get to the finish line. The book's not going to write itself. It's a grind. I I call it a passion marathon. And, you know, there's times where you work on it for three weeks and you've got to leave it alone for three weeks and just kind of hit the refresh button because you read it over and over and over again. And you get to a point where you don't know what, if what you wrote is actually any good because you've read it so many times that you're almost blind to it at that point. So, you've got to have a lot of mental fortitude to get something like this to the finish line. And I didn't have any sort of mentorship. This is the first book I've ever written. I didn't know exactly how to start, but I did want to finish. I contemplated a lot about submitting a lot of book proposals to various publishing houses across the country. But ultimately I figured I'd probably get rejected. That's what everyone, uh, told me and it would it, you could spend a lot of years trying to get noticed with a proposal that goes nowhere and I wasn't interested in wasting that much time just doing nothing with the story I wanted to complete the product so I decided to go the self publishing route uh, I hope it was the right decision I guess uh so I I kind of took everything to my own hands uh hired an editor hired someone to do the cover work and help me get a professional product in the end um you know, I, I wish this was my fourth or fifth book and not my first book because I could have done that much better of a job. But the book world is so hard to navigate in, in today's day and age. There's way too many books. It's oversaturated. There's a million different options on how to go about publishing a book. So it, it was a challenge. And I, I don't know, ultimately, if I, I did it the best way possible. Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing was getting getting a complete final product done into the public because it's not something I wanted to spend, you know, half a decade uh, messing around with. I, I was determined to finish it and uh, got it done after about two years worth of work. So I guess along those lines, anything you would do different when putting this project together? I just I wish I had more experience and, and more resources within the book industry to help get more publicity, to, to help fine tune the editing. Uh, you know, I, I kind of took it all on my own shoulders and, and did what I could, but with, with a budget, you got, I had to have a budget in mind. And this is all coming out of my own pocket and my own time invested. It, it would have been nice to have more help in that regard. And so, <laughs> you know, hopefully I still did the story plenty of justice because I, I think the story, the story was great, whether I wrote it or wrote about it or didn't write about it. Uh, you know, I just kind of polished it back up and reserved it and kind of organized everything so everyone could have access to it going forward. Are there future books in your uh, in your sites right now? I've got a couple ideas floating around. I'm not sure yet if I ultimately want to pursue it. <laughs> it. It's a huge undertaking. It's a it's a huge investment to to do something like this, and I. I'm still wavering on if I have the same level of passion as I did for Unmasked on these other subject matters floating around. Uh, so I, I, 
I imagine at some point uh, I'll get I'll get the urge again. But uh, for now, I'm, I'm still catching my breath a little bit after writing on that. Props to you and being able to put something like this, an idea pen to paper, literally, and, and get this thing up and out. Because I know I thoroughly enjoyed reading about it again, even though I knew some of the details on some of the stories you were telling. It was just like, oh, you know, and then seeing again the names like I talked about. And I, I cannot remember the name off the top of my head. The coach, though, uh, at Watson at the time, he, he was a, a groundskeeper for the uh, Colorado Springs Sky Sox. And I remember we took a bunch of kids from the Dave Schultz camp one year out to a Sky Sox game and they're, 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 you know, dragging the infield between and it was, that was the guy. And I'm like, I know that guy. So, uh, you know, his name is escaping me right now, but again, it's like some of those cool connections as you read this book, they're all over the place. And I think anybody that's grown up in the state of Colorado or spent any time around the wrestling community in Colorado Springs, that goes for athletes at the Olympic training center who, you know, might know where Doherty high school is from running camps or, or know where Coronado is where with the Burax and where Henry Cejudo went and, you know, countless others in, in the Springs and then up near in suburban Denver, where you've got some really powerhouse programs and, and, and as far as up as, as Loveland with, uh, with Tyler Graff and Connor Medbury with their, their legacies there. So there's a lot of, lot of things wrestling fans out there can really dive and dig out of this story because, you know, I touched on the, the kid from my hometown Well, he's old way over me now, uh, from my hometown who lost in the finals. And I think everybody's got a story they can kind of relate this story to. So I think there's some definite national appeal to it. Again, I'm making the sales pitch for you, Brady, unmatchthebook.com. And in the time we got left, uh, w- what are, I guess, the lessons that you've learned, not just from from Tom and Brett through this whole story, but maybe your own personal journey, your own vision quest to put this book together? Yeah, I mean, just the essence of competition and losing is such a good thing. I, I don't care what it is. It, it, it is really character building. How we, it doesn't matter if it's business, sports, your marriage, friendships, whatever, uh, how you respond to adversity ultimately is what defines you. And that's what makes the story of Tom so unique is how well that he handled that excruciating loss on the biggest stage you could possibly imagine with history on the line. And for him to handle himself like that, I mean, it, it still resonates with me, his perspective on that loss, his perspective on the sport. And how minimal it really is in terms of importance uh, is something that I, I've kind of taken from Tom as I go about my life, as I as I go about being a husband. Uh, so, you know, it, it's just a story with so many themes that anybody can take something from. The Short Time Wrestling Podcast is proudly outfitted by Compound Sportswear. Shirts, singlets, custom gear orders, everything you need. Call up Cliff and the crew at cmpteamwear.com. Hey, you know what? Did you like the show? You want to hit that subscribe button? MattTalkOnline.com slash listen. Various different ways to subscribe to this show on your favorite podcatcher of choice. And if you're already subscribed and you're already listening and you love the show and you want to support this show and this network, MattTalkOnline.com slash join the team. Become a team member today.